yeah. Uh, I'm so blessed uh, to be here, and, and the thing that I want to do before I preach every time is to pray, um, just kind of warm up spiritually, um, go into God's presence, get my mind right, um, help us get our minds right. Uh, just like Ben said, uh, that prayer is a big part of who we are, um, and we get to use God's Word to pray a lot. And so, um, yeah, I'm just going to pray real quick, and then we'll get into it, okay? Father, I praise you for who you are. Lord, like it's already been said so many times this morning, and it's going to be said um, a lot more times, Father, that you are, you are good, uh, you are holy, and that you have shown a love um, that is unfathomable. Uh, Lord, you have shown a love that, um, that doesn't make a lot of sense, uh, Lord, that it's, it's so, so great. Uh, Lord, you have shown a love that has changed uh, my life and so many others. God, just prepare us um, in this time, Father, to listen, to be attentive, to take away distractions, uh, Lord, to bind Satan. Um, God, not to be thinking about lunch or, or what's coming after or the stresses of the week. Uh, God, but I pray that we just get refueled um, in this time. I pray that I can worship Lord, I pray that, uh, that the people here and the people online can worship. God, you have, you have shown a love that is so humbling, and I pray that you speak through me today. If there's anything you don't want me to say, take it away now. I love you, Jesus. Thank you so, so much. I ask all that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen. All right. Well, like I said, good morning, good morning. I'm drink some water real quick. Okay, so I was doing some research. Today is December 6th, right? Is it December 6th? Yes? Okay, cool. Good nod. Um, so December 6th, at least according to Google, um, is St. Nicholas Day. So um, it has become later on known as Santa. But um, it recognizes the saint that became kind of the modern-day inspiration for Santa Claus. Um, and he was known for selling all his possessions, giving his money to the poor, all that good stuff. Um, you might see him if you look in the back. There you are, Santa. What's up? <laughs> I was really hoping you were wearing the Santa Claus hat today. <laughs> um, but yeah, Christmas is right around the corner. If you haven't um, noticed at all, um, that it, yeah, it's coming up here in just a little bit. Um, and honestly, Christmas is is getting farther and farther away um, from the original intention. It's becoming less synonymous with Jesus and becoming more synonymous with like decorations and food and all this stuff. Um, and so, just a, a question for reflection that I had this week. Um, so, my wife, Claire, is, is right over here. Um, a lot of you know her. Um, a lot of you know that we're married. Um, if I only spoke to Claire once a year on her birthday for like an hour and a half, and that was it, like, would you call that a good relationship? Or would you call that a deep relationship or any kind of relationship? Probably not. Yeah, probably not. Yeah, if I only spoke to Claire <laughs> once a year on her birthday... Um, and it's kind of what we do with Jesus now, at least in, in the States, um, is we make a big deal about Jesus once or twice a year for a couple of hours. And so if we do that, I, like, I wouldn't say that's the most important thing in my life, that Jesus has changed my life, that he's defined it. Um, I, I just wouldn't say that. And in the song that we just sang a little bit ago, it says, um, I, might, I might butcher it here, but it says, Upon his grace I will daily ponder. So that, that lyric is so, so true that I'm not going to just go on, on Easter and on Christmas and just spend a little bit of time, and I'll, okay, Jesus, I'm going to slot away this time, I'm going to give just a couple hours, but the rest of the year is mine. But no, that, that song is so true, and Scripture affirms that song of like, upon your grace, I will daily ponder. I will think about it daily. I need you daily. And we live in a culture that really buries Jesus at the Christmas time under like presents and decorations and food and all this stuff. And those things aren't bad in and of themselves. They're, they're like fun, harmless things. But if we're not careful, like I said, we can kind of lose the meaning of Christmas and we can get away from it and be like, man, I'm more excited to talk about Santa or I'm more excited to, to, for the presents of the Christmas tree. I'm more excited for just the decorations and the cookies and all that stuff than I am to talk about Jesus and just to ponder on his word. So, like I said, I want to I be careful of that, and just like we talked about a second ago, that Jesus deserves our attention 
every second of every day, not just on Christmas and not just on Easter. And I need to be reminded of the goodness of God that he would come down to this earth, so Christmas, and live a perfect life without sin and die on the cross for your sin and for my sin and rise on the third day. So Easter, conquering sin and conquering death, and now he offers me eternal life with him. If I turn from myself and I choose to follow him, and so I need that every second of every single day. I don't, I don't just need that twice a year for a couple of hours. And there are, it seems like, billions of outlets nowadays that are telling me that I don't need Jesus, um, that I need these other things to fulfill me. I need these other things to satisfy me. I can find satisfaction in these other places. And so what I want to just encourage you before we start here today is don't just make a big deal about Jesus for a few hours in December and in April. It's not what God says in his word, and honestly, you're missing out from his daily grace, that his mercies are new every single morning, and I want to ponder that every single day. So today, um, it is up sweet. Uh, We're going to get into John um, 3.16. I chose a picture of a record player, um, because I feel like this verse is kind of like a broken record for a lot of people. Um, it's super, super popular. We've heard it like over and over and over and over again. So it's just kind of this repeating thing. Um, but that's, that's a shame. It it really is. And I want to talk about that today. So just to, to read it, you might have it memorized. So still pay attention, please. Um, but John 3, 16 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. So, I mean, this is the verse that has been on youth t-shirts for the past like 2,000 or so years. Um, It's actually infected our culture quite a bit. All right, here we go. Sweet. Okay, there we go. It worked. Um, So, yeah, I don't know if y'all remember Tim Tebow. He's not really playing football anymore. He's kind of doing the baseball thing or announcer thing or something. I don't know. But anyway, he was really popular um, quarterback for Florida back in the day. Um, He was a really, really um, a light for Jesus. Still is, as far as I know. But he wore John 3.16 on his face a lot and got it really, really popular. So um, it's infected our culture. And that way you see it on bracelets, posters, tattoos, um, all this kind of stuff. It's kind of like um, just the overplayed song that when you first listen to it, it's like really, really catchy or really good or really powerful. But the more you listen to it, it's like, man, this is, this is really annoying. Or you kind of start to lose the meaning of it. So for Claire and I, at least for me, it's Hamilton. I don't know if y'all seen the musical, but I'm so sick of that musical now. At the beginning, it was great. It was awesome um, and, and super powerful, super creative. But now I'm like, I can't stand that thing. Um, yeah, and, and so we say, like, I've heard this before. Like, I've heard John 3.16, um, especially in America, especially in the South. Um, and it's like, come on, man. Like, you know, everybody knows this verse. And we kind of get, like, spiritually cocky. Um, where we're like, we don't think about a verse as much because of its exposure um, or because it's on a bunch of teacups and plates and, and all this kind of stuff. Um, and it's easy to think you understand something um, and understand what it means and to be off um, because you, you get prideful or to think that other people know what something means just because it's out there all the time. And so, for example, um, yeah, so this is <laughs> Stone Cold Steve Austin. And uh, I don't think he got the meaning right on uh, John 3.16. So he put Austin 3.16 on his verse, uh, or on his shirt. Um, I can't really explain what it means because it's kind of bad. Um, but, yeah, so obviously our culture is not, like, you know, stellar and understands, like, yeah, I get John 3.16. Um, <laughs> they're kind of taking it a little bit of a different way there. Um, and so like most things, when you leave something out um, or you don't explain enough, Um, It can lose its meaning, or there can be like dire consequences. Um, And especially in this verse, when you break it down, it's talking about life and death. And it's not just talking about life and death, it's talking about eternal life and eternal death. And so what I want to do is I want to slow down (laughs) when we're talking about this verse. Because wouldn't you want someone to explain something a little bit more if it had to do with eternal life and eternal death? Like I would want somebody to say, like, slow down, tell me what you're saying. I wouldn't want to go up to somebody and just say, yeah, if you, like, Jesus loves you, and you're good if you believe in him. But if you don't, then you're going to perish forever. And just be like, okay, bye. Like, that's it. 
Like, I, the person wouldn't be like, okay, sweet, I get it. No, they would be like, what does it mean to believe in him? Like, I, I want to get this right. Like, what, how do I know him? How do I, like, I don't want to perish forever. And so, again, I, I want to I slow down and do that because that's what people are being told um, at large of, like, just believe in Jesus and you're good. Just, just believe in him and you're good. And they, and they don't explain what that means. Um, and so a lot of people are believing in Jesus and they're not actually believing in him. Um, that they're going down this path and they're following the crowd and they're living a life that is not surrendered to Jesus and it doesn't show belief and they, and they think they're good. They think they're golden because one person said, just believe in Jesus, you're good to go. And, and it was that simple. And so they, they believe they're heading to eternal life when really they're heading to eternal perishing. And so we've got to do a good job of slowing down and saying, what, what does this mean? And so um, I have a scene that I want to play. This is it, Hannah. This is a big moment. Um, so it's like 15 seconds long. I'm going to do some explaining before they, they get it up here in a second. Um, but it's from uh, Mission Impossible. I don't know if you've seen the Mission Impossible scenes. We're not going to play the whole movie. Um, two hours, and then I'm going to go sit down. Uh, but it's like 15 seconds long. Oh, perfect. That's great. There's like They say a bad word like two seconds before this, so if you didn't think church was exciting, way to go, Hannah. Um, but yeah, so kind of uh, just some context, what they're doing. So they're like a, a team of spies, and they have to get to, or they're on the 130th floor, or no, they have to get to the 130th floor, sorry about that, um, of the Burj Khalifa. I think I said that right, but it's the tallest building in the world. Um, and they just found out that they have to do it from the outside. Um, so they've got to climb on outside of the building, and they've got to go up to get to the server room. And so per perspective, 130th floor out of 163 floors. Um, so it's not like eternal life and death scenarios, but it is life and death scenarios. Um, so um, not a lot of time on there, but did you see what happened? So Tom Cruise's character, he realizes he's the one that has to climb outside of the building. So that's already kind of scary. He's 100, like he's 130 floors up. Um, and then he's like given this new thing that he has never used before. And Benji, the other character, just says it real fast. He's like, blue, it's fine. Red, you're dead. And he's like, if you see his face and look at it, he's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Like, what, what did you say? <laughs> like, can you explain that again? Can you let me know like what that means? Like what happens if it does go red? Like all this stuff. And so if I was him, I would like be like, we need to take a second, and we need to talk about this. Um, and that's what we do with, with John 3.16, and, and when we share Jesus sometimes, it's like, God loves us, God gave Jesus, believe him, you're, you're good to go, and that's it. And if you don't, you perish forever. And it's kind of like, wait, whoa, one second, one second. And so when we, when we speed through it, and we don't explain enough, or we, we do injustice to the gravity of the situation, and so the situation is that eternity is on the table. Your eternal soul is on the table. So this verse doesn't just affect the next five minutes or the next 30 minutes or the next five years, the next 50 years, but it affects the next trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions of years. So like I said, we're going to go through this verse and we're going to slow down um, because it's a verse that affects all of our eternities. So here we go, John 3.16. Um, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. So starting in that first section, for God so loved the world. So you're not just loved, but you're so loved. Um, and did you notice that something, it seems to be like missing from this verse, and you may have missed it, but it's the word because. Um, so for God so loved the world because we did a bunch of stuff for him. Um, or for God so loved the world because he's lonely. For God so loved the world because of your stuff, because of the things that you do, because of your good looks, your intellect. It's like, no, those are, those are not the because in this verse. Jesus loves you. That's it. There is no because I did this, because I was so good, because I was so smart, because I, I talked about him all the time. And that's what makes this love so unfathomable and so crazy is because it's not because of what we do. It's not because of how great I am. It's not because I'm so smart. It's because he loves us so much. And that's the part 
where the more we talk about God's love, the more ludicrous it gets. Because I'm like, why? Why did you show so much grace to me? Why did you show so much love to me when I didn't worship you, when I didn't love you? And so it's a super humbling thought when we talk about that lyric of who am I that the highest king would welcome me? Like, who am I? Who is Kyle that Jesus would say, I, I want to love him? Romans 5, 6 through 8 says, For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So I imagine like the headline in Jerusalem says, Perfect God dies for weak, ungodly sinners who deserve eternal punishment and offers eternal life to those who repent and follow him. It doesn't make, it doesn't make a lot of sense. And that is so, so humbling because it's not because of what I did. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I was in my parents' backyard um, and Claire was working at the time. And so I was just like running around, getting some exercise and stuff. And I see the sun come up kind of through the trees and I I'm just staring there and kind of just pondering, and so just some context for you, my parents' backyard is a pretty special place for me. Um, it's where I spent most of my young adult life. Um, I would walk for hours and hours and hours in that backyard, um, so much so that I actually killed the grass, so there's like a, a figure eight um, of just raw ground <laughs> um, that I, I put there over the years, um, and I would walk in the morning, I would walk during the day, I would walk when it's like pitch black at night, but the point is um, I spent a ton of of time in that backyard, and I just listened to music, and honestly, the worse it was, um, the more I liked it, I, I thought about a bunch of stuff, and I spent so much time there just not knowing Jesus, um, not, worshiping him, not worshiping him, not caring about him, not thinking about him, not, not doing things for him. I could literally care less most of the time while I was, while I was walking in that backyard, and it was actually in that backyard that I had the, the thought one day, I, th I must have been like 16 or 17, and I was like, man, Christianity is so uh, like oppressive. Like I don't want to uh, submit to something that seems to have so many rules. And looking back on it now, it's like, yeah, like you mean he, you don't want me to do things that are bad for me? <laughs> like, like, wow, that's so awful, <laughs> you know? And, and, I, and I, I bet you like Jesus was watching me that whole time I was walking back there, not worshiping him, not thinking about him, having these awful thoughts about him and saying, man, I love that guy. Like, I, I want him to know me. Makes no sense. <laughs> like, it's the most humbling thing in the world that Jesus would look at that and say, like, I love Kyle, even though I did nothing to deserve his love. And so I was looking up at the sun uh, coming through the trees, and I was just thinking, like, wow, I have eternal life in Jesus. And I never thought I'd be standing in this same place, in this backyard, and my life is completely changed because of him. That he loved me so much, and he came and he sacrificed himself. I never thought I'd be standing there again, going from not caring at all and having these thoughts, and going to, man, I love Jesus more than anything. And so I just keep thinking, like, why would you extend this grace to me? I didn't care about you, and you offer me eternal life. And it's because of his love. It's because he loves so perfectly. And so that simple catchphrase, we scroll over that too, or scroll over, or go fast over, or whatever, is Jesus loves me. And we focus so much on the, on the Jesus loves, and that's an incredible fact, um, but the more incredible thing is the, is the you and me at the end of it. And it's like Jesus loves me even though I'm a sinner, even though I didn't worship him, even though I didn't pay attention to him. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves you even though we rebelled against him. So that's, that's just an incredible, incredible fact that, again, that Jesus loves. Jesus loves is, is incredible, but the end of that sentence, Jesus loves me, is, is just mind-boggling. And so God's grace is not meant to push us towards guilt or pride to say I'm good or, or I'm so, so lowly, but it's meant to push us towards worship. And that, that unfathomable love is meant to push us towards, 
hey, I want, I want you to have everything. I want to worship you. I want to make much of you. And I was reading Genesis 32 um, a couple of days ago, and I, I loved this story. So Jacob um, is trying to return to his brother Esau, and Jacob has, has really screwed over Esau a couple of times, um, and he hasn't seen him in a long time. So he's like, man, I think he's going to be like really, really upset. Um, but he prays um, in, in that passage, and I loved that prayer, and I thought it gave a great context, kind of what I felt in my backyard a couple days ago. Um, and he prays this in Genesis 32.10. He says, I am not worthy of the least of all the deeds of steadfast love and all the faithfulness that you have shown to your servant. For with only my staff I crossed this Jordan, and now I've become two camps. So Jacob is just, he's in awe, and he's saying, I'm not worthy of this grace that you have shown me. I'm not worthy of the blessing that you have given me. And then later on in that story, a little bit later on, when Jacob is expecting Esau to be like, ah, like I'm so mad at you, like you took everything away from me, <laughs> like, and then you ran off for 20 years. Like he actually embraces him, and that's another picture of God's grace of saying, man, I'm not worthy to be called your brother in, in this case. And Esau extends and shows that picture of God's grace of saying, like, no, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. I want you to be with me. So let's move on to the next part of the verse. So, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. I know I keep reading over again, but... So God loved the world so, so much... And the action because of that is that he gave his one and only son. So he didn't have 30 sons and to, to spare. Like, it wasn't like Jesus just got unlucky in, in the lineup. And, and just a reminder that God doesn't need us. So he's not going to these great lengths because he has something to get out of it. Like I said before, because he's lonely. Or, or because of some other reason. He's doing this because he loves us, which makes it even crazier. And he wants everyone to come to a saving knowledge of him. So he comes down to this earth, and he takes the punishment that we deserve. And we've done nothing to deserve this love. I just want to remind you that God loves you infinitely more than you can possibly imagine. And this makes me want to worship him. This makes me want to give everything to him because of this crazy, crazy love that God got involved and came down to this earth and didn't just leave me in my sin, but says, I want you to come and be with me for eternity. I'm going to give you a chance to do that. In the last part of this verse, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And so the verse, it doesn't say just whoever should not perish, but have eternal life. It says whoever believes in him. And the word believes, I think, is more powerful than a lot of people give it credit for. And so a lot of people say, I believe in God but I think what they mean is I believe he exists, and that's it. And it stops right there. And so I, I can't say it any better than this, but yeah, you keep using that word. I think it means what you think it means. <laughs> and so to believe in something is not only to say it exists, but to trust in it. So it wouldn't make much sense for me to say I believe in like that rock, on the ground. That rock is not going to do anything for me. I believe it exists, but I don't trust in it. Or to say, I believe in the Cowboys and their coaching staff. Like, I know they exist, I think. <laughs> I know they exist, but I don't trust in them. <laughs> Praise God. And like, no, I, be I believe in Jesus and when I say I believe in him, it means I, I trust in him. And it's an action. And we try to say we believe in, in other things. We try to go different routes besides Jesus. And it, it just never, ever works out. And we try to trust in other things. 
So it's back to the, the cowboys. You know, I believe, or, hmm. <laughs> I believe every year it's going to, you know, it's going to go well. And they always fail me in the playoffs. <laughs> or I believe, you know, with, with this other thing I believe in, I believe, you know, I can go this way or I can go this way. I can go, you know, up the middle or whatever. It's always going to fail. It's always going to fail if it's not Jesus. And so, again, it's not simply just saying, I believe that God exists. It's, I trust in him. And God is not going to say to you, like, sweet, did you simply think I existed? Come on in. You just say, like, I think he was there. Like, come on in. Like, no, that is, that is not the standard. The standard is, did you know me? <laughs> did you put your trust in me? Did you follow me? Did you give your life to me? And so a little bit before John 3.16, Jesus is talking to a guy um, named Nicodemus. And the Bible describes him as a Pharisee and a, a ruler of the Jews. And they're talking about being born again and this idea of being born again. And Jesus says in verse 3, he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus is confused by this, but Jesus is saying that there is a change. There is a change when you choose to follow him. You are born again. That there is a difference, and he's, he's equating it to the spiritual rebirth as a child of God. And so Claire is uh, a labor and delivery nurse. She's been one, I guess, about two months now um, or something like that. So she, she's seen a lot of babies, a lot of births. Um, and I am no labor and delivery nurse, but I... I imagine it's a dramatic act pushing a baby out of your body. Um, lots of lots of screaming, lots of guts, lots of squeezing, yelling, possible cursing, desperation, crying, all this stuff. But it's it's a it's a dramatic thing. There's a big difference from when the baby is inside to when the baby is outside. And so it would be hard for a guy to to be in the room and the baby's inside, then to walk out of the room and come back in and the baby's outside, and then to go, hmm. Honey, there's something different about you. I don't know what it is. I can't put my finger on it, but there's something different <laughs> um, there. And so when you, when you come to know Jesus, there is, a, there is a change. He changes your heart. He changes your desires. He changes your dreams. And he makes you different. He makes you more into the image of him. So there is, there is a spiritual rebirth that takes place. And so if someone tells me, that they believe in something, but their life doesn't match that. Isn't that kind of confusing? Isn't that kind of weird? So it's kind of like we talked about earlier, that if I only talk to Claire once or twice a year, we don't really have a close relationship. And if I only talk about Jesus every once in a while, or if I only talk to Jesus every once in a while, if I only think about Jesus every once in a while, from an, a non-spiritual, just unbiased opinion, would you think that I care much about him? Or that I've put my trust in him, that I believe in him, based on the definition of believe that we just talked about. And recently I was talking to a coworker, and we had, we had gotten on the kind of topics of like spiritual backgrounds, like how did you grow up, how did I grow up, all that kind of stuff. And we got on the subject of church, and she says, well, I can't, you know, you don't have to go to church to be a Christian. I said, yeah, like you're, you're totally right. Like you don't, like that is not what it requires to be saved. But some things to think about is if I do nothing in terms of Jesus all year long, does that, does that raise concern or just question about my relationship with him? If I make no big deal about him whatsoever all year long. And so the only requirement for, for knowing or for being <laughs> in eternity with Jesus is putting your trust in him and turning from your sin and following him. It's not going to church, but the result of me putting my trust in Jesus is going to be, I want to know him more. I want to be around people that know him. I want to talk about him. And so again, it goes back to that, that thing of, of the spiritual rebirth, that there is going to be a change when I choose to follow Jesus and when Jesus, change, when Jesus does that to my life. And so big decisions, they, they change your life. They really do. So when I, when I move, when I have a new job, um, my example today was marriage. 
Uh, it changed my life inf- infinitely better. And I act differently now because of it. And so one example is like, I don't sleep in jeans anymore. <laughs> I know you think it's weird, but you haven't tried it. It's really comfy. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't sleep in jeans anymore. Because I realized, you know, it, it's kind of strange. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I love Claire infinitely more than I love sleeping in jeans. And so I, I gladly lay down my jeans, <laughs> put on sweatpants. Um, because I'm, I'm married, it's changed my life. That's a very small example of how it's changed my life. But, but again, another question, if a married person still acted like they were an unmarried person, that would be very, very strange. That would be weird. So if someone who professes to follow Jesus does the things that Jesus hates all the time, that's weird. <laughs> that's strange. I'm going to move on to the last little bit of the verse. For God so loved the world, He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And so what is it? To perish again. I want to. I want to talk about the definition of these words um, rather than just just going over them. So perish, to become destroyed or ruined, cease to exist. In the context of this verse, it's for eternity. And so sometimes the stakes of of heaven and of hell are downplayed by the culture or by ourselves. And so I remember. This must have been like 2013, and I was um, out sharing with the, the Baptist student ministry. I know a lot of y'all know it, but for those that don't, um, it's a ministry on UTA's campus and that a lot of us are involved in. And I, I think I was, um, I must have been a sophomore, and I was talking to this guy, and we, we had gone like through the whole gospel, and we, we got to um, basically heaven and hell, of like eternity apart from Jesus or eternity with Jesus. And I'd never heard this before. And we, we talked about it, and he said, you know what? I'm all right with going to hell. I kind of want to go to hell. And I said, do you know, like, what that means? <laughs> like, uh, do you understand the, the gravity of that? And he said, yeah, like, you know, lake of fire, all this stuff. I think it's going to be great. And now, honestly, looking back, I think he was just trying to get under my skin, trying to surprise me or something with a different answer. But it, it broke my heart, <laughs> to hear him say, I, I welcome that. I want to go to that, to that eternal suffering. I, I want that. And at the time, I could have done a way better job of explaining like what that means, but I'm going to let Scripture do it today. So this is 2 Thessalonians 1, 5 through 9, and there's a bunch of other Scriptures. I just chose this one. And it says, This is evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God, for which you are also suffering, since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven and his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His might. And on the flip side, talking about heaven. This is Revelation 21, 1 through 4. It says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. So in, in summary, even though we didn't love God, we didn't worship Him, we didn't do anything to deserve Him, He loved us and came down to this earth 
and sacrificed himself, lived a life without sin, perfect, sacrificed himself on the cross, took the judgment that we deserved for our sins, not for his, but for our sins, and rose on the third day and conquered sin and conquered death. And if you believe in him and you put your trust in him and only in him, he will forgive your sins and you'll be washed clean before God and you will not perish. You have eternal life with him. So by the very nature of that statement, he also says that if you choose not to trust in him and to reject him, that you will perish for eternity apart from him. I'll just read a little bit after John 3.16. Starting in verse 17, it says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. So this is the weight of the decision. This is the weight of the verse. That it's an eternal decision of life and death. And I just want to I want to talk to anyone who feels like they haven't made that decision. That they haven't put their trust in Jesus. They haven't believed in Jesus. Maybe you believe he exists you haven't put your trust in him, that Jesus is still inviting you to be with him every second of every day. And it doesn't matter what you've done, it doesn't matter what you know or what you don't know, that he is still inviting you. And so I just want to invite you as someone who has had their life changed forever by Jesus to join him. And he's not looking for perfect people, it's actually quite the opposite and if you have never, ever done that before, I just want to tell you to do that. Don't think or make the mistake that you have more time because you have no clue how much time you have in eternity. It's on the other side. And for those of us that do know him, that have put our trust in him, that have believed in him, we've got to tell other people about this because it's eternity, it's forever. And you wouldn't be sitting here if God hadn't spoken through somebody. You wouldn't be sitting here and saying, I'm, I'm with Jesus forever. So I'm so thankful for the kid that was obedient and said, I, I don't know all the answers, but I do know the good news of Jesus. I'm going to share it, because he changed my life forever. And God spoke through him. We're going to move on to application, or I like to call question for reflection, or basically like, what do I do about this? Um, and I want to preface, all of these are uh, need to be in the context of COVID, uh, so just be responsible. Um, COVID responsibly, I guess. <laughs> um, so yeah, so application, questions for reflection, we'll, we'll go through these um, real quick. Uh, the first one, if you're taking notes, and these will be on the website later, so if you're like, Kyle, I'm tired, I want to take notes, one... <laughs> You can get over it. <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> two will be on the website later. Uh, so the first one is don't be influenced um, by this world. Be transformed by Jesus. So Romans 12, 2 says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. So make Jesus not just a section of Christmas this year, but the central theme this year and every year and every day for the rest of your life. I don't put gas in my car once a year and expect it to be good for the rest of the year. It's foolish. Number two, are you oversaturated um, by the world? I know that I tend to tend to go this way sometimes, um, but if I if I spend more time in the world, 
thinking about the world, constantly being bombarded by the world and the things of the world, I'm going to start to look like the world. So you are what you eat. Am I eating the Word of God or Facebook or the news? And it's not that those are bad things, but if I'm, if I'm overindulgent in those things, it starts to pull, I, I felt that before, it starts to pull me away from Jesus. When I'm putting more time, more stock in those things than in Him, when the music that I'm listening to, the videos that I'm watching, the things that I'm doing, the things that I'm saying, they'll start to, it's like a disease, it starts to pull me away from the Word of God, it starts to make us say, make, say like, it's not, I don't have time for that anymore, I don't have time to worship, I don't have time to talk about Him because I want to do this. I think differently throughout the day. And it's hard here because people are affirming it. <laughs> like our culture affirms it. Like don't think about Jesus, think about yourself. Like the, the treat yourself thing, you know. Like think about yourself all day long. And I, I know it's hard. I know I've fallen into it too because there's no opposition to a lifestyle like that. America is going to tell you that's great. That's what I want you to do. <laughs> I want you to just think about yourself. Number three, we're doing time. Oh, we're great. Uh, am I living as if I have eternal life with Jesus after this? Or do people look at my life and the way I spend my time, the way I spend my money, the way I talk, and they're like, well, this is, this is all there is. He's not living for eternity. Like he's, he's living for right here, right now, in this life. What upsets me? What gives me joy? Again, you have to be different than the world. How you spend your time, how you spend your money, the way you speak. Number four, this is more of like a, a practical tip of like spending time with Jesus. Um, so it, I kind of I call it spiritually warming up. <laughs> um, so what happens if you like don't warm up before exercise? Like if I want to go run a marathon, I get out of bed and I just like go. Probably gonna pull something, you know, pull a hammy, get injured, something like that. So the the <laughs> odds of injury increase dramatically. Um, and so I just want to suggest a tip of like spending your time with Jesus. I, I suggest that you that you warm up by praying. Um, I suggest that you warm up by by getting your mind right before God and not just rushing in, because I've known, at least for me, when I do that, I don't really get much out of it. <laughs> it's just kind of like a checklist. Um, I just I, I zoom through. I don't think about it for the rest of the day, so I encourage you not to rush into the presence of God, but to, to pray, to, to humble yourself, to get your mind right. And just realize that you're going into the presence of a king Number five, so the last one as well, um, is that God has divinely placed you in the spot that you're in right now. So if you're a student in the classes that you're in, uh, maybe the dorm, maybe at home uh, for now, uh, for anybody else, the job that you're in, the family that you're in, um, he, he has placed you there for a purpose. So pray to make an impact in the community that you're in. If you don't know where, if you don't know where to start, your neighbor's. Um, that's a great place to start. The people that live closest to you, like, Kyle, where do I start ministry? Where do I start telling people about Jesus? I suggest your neighbors, the people that are right around you, um, to make an impact in that community. Um, another easy way to invite people into your life, literally, um, is to, to have people come with you to do the things that you're already planning to do that day. If you're going to the grocery store, Invite somebody who doesn't know Jesus. If you're going to like the laundromat, invite somebody who doesn't know Jesus. If you're going to have dinner, invite somebody over who doesn't know Jesus or who, who does know Jesus. We can encourage each other. But just make that a part of your life, of, of hospitality, of inviting people over into your life. And again, I, with COVID, I want you to be smart. <laughs> don't, be, don't be dumb um, on this of like inviting like 30 people over when there's a pandemic. So have some, have some discretion. Um, yeah, another thing is just share your story. Just talk about how Jesus has changed your life. 
Don't, don't keep that to yourself. Be excited about that. Be excited about what Jesus has done in your life. Whether you grew up in church or whether you didn't grow up in church, whether you, I don't know, killed somebody and now you know Jesus or you like stubbed your toe and you said ouch too loud when you were a kid and now you repented and know Jesus. Like, yeah, just share that story with people. Because I think that helps with people that give no credit to the Bible um, give no credit um, to that. It's not, that's not going to do anything for them, but your story can make a big impact in people's lives. It's hard to argue with um, that Jesus changed my life. Can I tell you how he did? And then back that up with being hospitable. So in closing, um, yeah, Christmas, like I said, is it, right around the corner, uh, but I want to make a big deal about Jesus every single day of my life. Um, he gave me an eternity with him. And so just think about your community. Think about who's around you. Think about who can I talk to about Jesus. Is it my neighbor? Is it my classmate? Is it my mom, my dad, my, my sister, my brother, my son, my daughter? But, but think about those things and, and ponder on his grace every single day for the rest of your life. I'll pray and then the, the band can come up. Um, Father, I just, yeah, I'm humbled and, and amazed that you would look at us and die for us and say, uh, I want him, I want her to come and be with me for eternity. God, I pray for our lives that we would not be swayed by this message of comfort this message of I need, to, I need to get what's mine and that's it. God, that's not why we're here. I pray you give us boldness to share, give us ideas, bring people to mind right now, God, that we can invite over for Christmas dinner. In the abundance that you've given us, I pray that we would give to others. And Lord, for anyone that doesn't know you, that has not chosen to follow you or believe in you, whether it's here or on the live stream, God, I pray that you'd work in their hearts right now. It's the most important decision that they'll ever make. And only you can save. Only you can change their hearts. It's not what I say, not what anybody else says. But you bringing them from, from death to life. And I hope we represent you well. I pray that we do. Thank you so much for this church. Thank you so much for where it's going. Thank you so much for how you've been so faithful to us. Pray that we stay true to your word and we follow you for the rest of our lives. God, we love you. I am humbled I get to spend eternity with you. In Jesus' name, amen.